You okay, here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about the mobilization effort for total war. So total war was needed because eventually um, patriotism and nationalism ran out uh, and you, they were still left fighting a war that they thought would only last a couple months and it certainly didn't. So total war is mobilizing an entire nation's resources for war. So it's using everything that a nation has at its disposal or a government has at its disposal to wage the war effort. Governments had abandoned laissez-faire and extended their power um, to reach really all areas. You, nothing was safe. Um, it wasn't a capitalist society anymore. If you were making shoes in your factory, the government could tell you that you were making shoes anymore. You were making bullets. Uh, that's the government extended their power. All except when we talked about the Russian government, uh, the the provisional government, and they they shrunk the government's power during the war, and that didn't turn out so well. But generally, uh, the total war was extending the power of the government. It was conscription for all countries, even Great Britain, who had a million men at the beginning of the war and had never had to conscript an army before. They needed conscription. Tens of millions, sold, tens of, millions of soldiers were conscripted during World War I. Abandonment of free market capitalism, as I said, abandoning laissez-faire, strict government regulation, and nationalization. Remember that nationalization is bringing transportation industries, all big business, under government control. So nationalizing something is to make it under the control of the nation or the government. So they did things like um, rent controls, price controls, fixed wage controls, rationing of food and resources, and strict export and import regulations. In order to pay for this war, they increased taxes. They used what the countries got from the nationalization of major transportation and other industries. Uh, they depreciated the currency and they borrowed money from the United States. So all citizens were responsible for this total war effort, but certainly not all nations did it as successfully as others. Um, if you could think for a second which country you think mobilized the best and which ones mobilized the worst. Hopefully, just based on what you know, you could come up with Germany being the most successful and the best example of total war. I have no idea why all of a sudden. Oh, yeah, there it is. Sorry. Um, so in Germany, um, they their coordination um, was so important. I mean, for all countries on the Western Front, that trench warfare, just in the Battle of Verdun alone, more projectiles were dropped than in any of the other previous wars. I mean, all of the other, 100 years war, 30 years war, all of the Franco-Prussian, Austro-Prussian, and all the wars combined just in one battle, more projectiles were dropped. So total war effort was, and maintaining that was important. Germany itself was already pretty authoritative, authoritarian, even before the war, so it wasn't a huge stretch for them to centralize their government and centralize their power. By 1916, William II realized that he wasn't very good at the war effort and turned over the government to generals. So Ludendorff and Hindenburg are your two famous German generals, and they will quickly establish Germany as a military dictatorship. Food for Germany was the biggest problem. Uh, 750,000 civilians died of hunger. That's not, I mean, that's beyond all the casualties of war. Uh, at the beginning of the war, they had the their calorie ration, and so they rationed food right from the beginning, and it was 1,350, so 1,350 calories per day. By the end of the war, it was 1,000 calories a day for men, women, and children in Germany, regardless of anything. It was 1,000 calories a day. So coordinating the war effort for Germany, Yes, the generals had quite a hand in it, um, but they appointed Walter Rathenau to head the War Raw Materials Board, and that was the coordination. So he used to, Rathenau used to head the electric company, and so he treated the war effort like big business, rationed all useful materials, and he coordinated to make sure that all the German soldiers had enough weapons and everyone had enough food. So he did it, the best job of any of the countries. Uh, one example and one identification that you'll need to know is this auxiliary 
service law in Germany, which said that all males, it was a law passed by the government that said all males 17 to 60 must work in a job deemed essential to the war effort. So it was really forced labor for all adult males. So men were forced to go with conscription into the military, but all men were forced to do something that was necessary for the war effort, even if it wasn't going to the trenches to fight. All right, so your second best example would be Britain. And they were OK, but they were so free in their liberal tradition. They had a difficult time transitioning, all right? Freedom is certainly first to go in wartime, not just in Britain, but in the United States and other countries. The first example of this abandonment of liberal tradition was Dora, not the explorer, but it was called the Defense of Realm Act. It was strict censorship for the press, and it said that government could take all supplies it needed from private citizens. So this meant your factories are right down to the farm and the food that you produced. Anything the government needed for war, they could take even from private citizens. The Ministry of Munitions was the British equivalent to the War Raw Materials Board. And it was coordinated by our famous three first name socialist, David Lloyd George. It's not supposed to be George's. It's David Lloyd George. He ration food, had rent controls, price controls, um, and he didn't do quite as good a job as Rathenau in Germany, um, but able to supply the British military and be able to feed the British people. So he did okay at coordinating total war, but it just wasn't quite as authoritative or authoritarian as the German because they were they did still have that that lingering liberalism, and they just didn't give up their rights quite as easy as the Germans did. All right, so then you have the French, and the French, you know, they've never really been all that great at industrialization or governing, or yeah, they, they've had their fair of share of troubles, and this World War I effort was no different. Uh, the military and the civilian authorities, so your government officials, really struggled to try and decide who should conduct the war effort. Um, the military thought they should be in full charge, and certainly the government thought they should be, as the Republicans had taken hold of the French, of the French government. By 1917, a guy named Clemenceau will come to power, and he believed that war was, as his quote, too important to be left to generals. And so he tried to re-centralize, pass censorship laws, uh, executed people who were outspoken against the war effort. And in 1917, there were a lot of people who were outspoken against this war effort that that was not that in, what anyone had anticipated. The biggest problem for the French, so Clemenceau does improve things, um, but the biggest problem for the French was the German occupation of northeastern France. Remember when France, when the war started and the Germans marched through Belgium, they still occupied right up until about 25 miles from Paris. And that was a huge resource important region for the French. So 75% of the coal production in France came from that region. About 80% of the steel making factories and capability were in that region that were now German occupied. So they just didn't even have the the resources or the, the method or the means to coordinate a successful war effort. All right, so Germans were the best uh, with Rathenau and the War Raw Materials Board. Then you had David Lloyd George and the Ministry of Munitions, okay. Uh, and the French were well, struggling, like always. And then you had the countries who were backwards. And most of the reason for their backwardsness was that they just hadn't industrialized. They didn't have the infrastructure. You can't coordinate and successfully conduct a war effort if you don't have the factories and the resources to begin with. And these are the countries that were those developed, kind of outside, struggling, not the inner zone countries. And these countries did then have the problem. You had Russia, who can only supply, you know, I think I said in, in class, a ha you know, half of their men. It was really more like a fourth of their men with arms. And so, you know, you send them into war saying, you know, when your two buddies die, pick up your gun, and you can use it then until you die, and then the guy behind you can take your gun. Eh, just, that wasn't a good situation. So their backwards economies helped them. They couldn't supply the necessary materials to their soldiers or to their, their home fronts and, and food. Okay. Impact of total war. Early on 
in the war effort. There was, you know, as we had said, great excitement and enthusiasm for war. The propaganda worked great, you know, all the way until about 19. 16 so it starts in the fall of 1914 until about 1916 and then there were groups like liberals and socialists who started to oppose the war effort and in some cases they needed to do it pretty quietly but in many cases they were pretty outspoken initial success of the the war effort was full employment uh, that most everyone had a job generally at not necessarily a well-paying job, but everyone had a job. Men were paid differently than women. Women, can, you know, made up a good portion of the the workforce on the home front, um, but they were not paid equal to men. Um, unions got quite a bit of power during this time. They agreed to cooperate with governments, and in return. Um, they, they said they wouldn't strike and they would cooperate and in return the unions got a bigger say in wages. Uh, this will translate uh, to more cooperation after the war and more power for unions and labor unions after World War I. Uh, the lives of the poor will improve. There'll be some, some evening uh, of the social structure and then your women will go to work um, at varying degrees. You had about a million and a half women in Britain uh, who went and did new jobs that previously were beyond their capabilities or at least once thought to be beyond the capabilities of women like the banking industry you'll go from 9,000 just as an example w women working in the banking industry to 64,000 um, by the end of the war now those women will not keep their jobs uh, they will be replaced by men and even though they did the jobs they will be told that the men will get their jobs back and the women weren't capable anymore now, the one lasting thing that will come out of the war for women uh, is the right to vote. Um, the British women will get the right to vote in 1918, Germans and Austria-Hungary in 1919 at the close of the war. The U.S. will grant women the right to vote in 1920, and the French are going to wait until 1944. I think we talked about that if you had the women essay last week, but the French will wait until 1944 to give their women the right to vote. Overall, once the war is over, the expectation for women will be that they go back home, that they go home and middle, upper middle class, middle class women, the expectation will be for them to stay home and to raise the kids. It, it does not translate World War I. Now, World War II is different, but World War I does not translate into a whole new workforce of women post-war. During the war, yes, but not post-war. Okay, so we talked about mobilization, total war, the Germans, the British, the French, and then the poor Russians, Austrians, and Italians. And the impact of this total war effort where all of a nation's resources go to war. And I came in under the 15 minutes today, so I hope you guys are having a good weekend. Uh, I will possibly post another one about the end of the war, uh, but maybe not till Monday. Bye-bye.